Hello and welcome to lecture 6 for the course ECE 1B uh, freshman seminar in computer engineering uh, spring 2020. Uh, this lecture is entitled binary search as you see on the title slide. As usual we start with some puzzles and uh, then we learn what binary search is and why um, it is a significant idea uh, in designing algorithms. So in way of introduction, um, I'm going to talk uh, for a few minutes about the game of 20 questions. Uh, this game used to be uh, on TV, although you may not have ever seen it because it was a long time ago. So the game of 20 questions worked like this. Uh, the host of the program thinks of something. Uh, could be a person, could be an animal, a plant, um, any other object, and so on. And you're allowed to ask up to 20 yes-no questions uh, in an effort to identify what the host was thinking uh, of, you know, what the subject of the uh, game is. So typically you First of all, if you ask 20 questions, you basically, yes, no questions, you have basically a binary tree with 20 levels because each yes, no question divides the space of possibilities into two parts. Okay, the first question at the top takes you to two sub-regions of the space of possibilities. And then in each of those sub-regions, the second question divides the space into two sub-regions and so on. Now your best bet in order to ensure you can find a uh, subject uh, of the game in as few questions as possible is to try to divide the space of possibilities as evenly as possible. So for example, if you take question one, uh, to ask, uh, is the subject an aircraft carrier? That's not a very good question because if you're very lucky and the subject is an aircraft carrier, of course you have identified. But more likely, the subject is not an aircraft carrier, and then you have only eliminated one point from the uh, space of possibilities, and therefore you have not really made any progress toward identifying uh, what the object might be. On the other hand, if you ask questions such as, is this subject of the game animate? Okay, this is a pretty good question because if the answer is yes, then you focus on people, animals, plants. And if the answer is no, then you focus on uh, lifeless objects. Okay, then if the answer is yes, your second question might be, is the subject human? So is it a person or some other animate uh, being? Again, if the answer is yes, you now search the space of humans. Of course, there are quite a few humans who can be the subject. And very likely, that's somebody that most people know. And therefore, you can focus on um, male versus female at that point. Uh, 
let's say, politicians, scientists, uh, celebrities, various categories of people. And then you, in each step, you have to divide the space as evenly as possible so that in the worst case, you can identify the subject in 20 questions. So this is a binary tree. And basically, we are implementing a search algorithm here. We are searching the space of possibilities, you know, the, the space of things or people that uh, the host might have thought of. And then you're trying to identify the one thing that the host had in mind. Now, with perfect questioning, if each question divides the space of possibilities in two exactly equal subspaces, you can identify one of to the power 20 possible answers. And to the power 20 is roughly 1 million. OK, so you know going in, that there's no guarantee you'll be able to find uh, the subject in 20 questions because there are way more than 1 million things or people in the world that can be the subject of the game. OK, so let's start with some puzzles now. Uh, here is a warm-up puzzle, as usual, an easy one. A large container is known to hold 24 ounces of nails. The hardware store has a balance, but no weights. So a balance is this device that you see here that can tell you whether two things have equal weights. You don't have weights. You don't have you no know, one ounce, 10 ounce, five ounce weights to weigh a specific amount. But you can tell whether two things or two set of things that you put on the two sides have the same weight. That's where the balance uh, uh, stays horizontal. Or one side is heavier than the other one when that side goes down and the lighter side goes up. Can you measure out nine ounces of nail for a customer? So you have a package of 24 ounces of nails. The customer wants nine ounces of nail, and you want to provide exactly nine ounces of nail using this scale and nothing else, no other device. Okay, so as usual, when I ask a question like this, please pause the video and see if you can solve a puzzle before. Uh, proceeding to the look at the answer. So here's my answer. First, divide all nails into two equal piles. In other words, pour the nails on the two sides of the scale, all of the nails in the box, and make sure that the two sides balance. Okay, you may have to do some trial and error. So put some nail on each side. If one side is heavier, then take a few nails and put them on the other side, and so on until you have a reasonable a balance uh, between the two sides. Okay. At this point, you can tell that each side contains 12 ounces of nail. So you basically manage to divide the 24 ounces of nail into two piles, each having 12 ounces of nail. Now take one of those piles of 12 ounces and do the same thing. Divide uh, that pile into two parts and make the uh, balance basically show balance so that the two sides are equal. Therefore, each side has six ounces of it. Okay, so if we were looking for 12 ounces or six ounces, we already have the answer. But we want nine, nine ounces. Well, the rest is easy. Take one of those six ounce piles, divide it into two halves, two equal halves, and then now take one six ounce 
pile that is left and one of the two three ounce piles which together constitute nine ounces of nail. So you manage to weigh exactly nine ounces of nails without having any weights, okay, just by uh, repeatedly dividing things into equal halves using the balance. Okay, you can say we were lucky that we needed nine ounces of nail. What if we needed 10 ounces? Would we be able to do it? Um, I'm not sure. I haven't worked that out. But you may sort of uh, uh, play with this a little bit and see what other amounts, what other weights, 10 ounces, 11 ounces, 12 ounces, of course, we know the answer already, 13 ounces, what about one ounce of nail, okay? See if those can be uh, delivered, those amounts, using the same mechanism. There's no guarantee that they all can be done. Okay, the second puzzle, chemist has a balance and fixed weights of one, two, four, and eight grams. So these are relatively small weights because, you know, when you weigh chemical substances, you typically deal with a small amount. So one gram, two grams, four grams, and eight grams. These are the weights that we have. So of course, if you want to weigh eight grams of a particular substance, chemical substance, you put the eight gram weight on one side of the balance and then add the substance to the other side until balance is established. And the amount you put there is eight ounces, okay? If you want 10 ounces, then you put the eight and two gram weights on one side, that's 10 grams. Sorry, if I said ounce, I meant grams. So you put eight and two grams on one side, that's 10 grams. And again, put the substance on the other side until balance is established. And you've got uh, 10 ounces of that substance. Okay, now, the puzzle asks you to show that this chemist can weigh any amount of material from one to 15 grams by placing the weights on one side and the material on the other. So think about this. How would you go about showing or establishing any amount of material from one to 15 grams in increments of one gram, okay? So one gram can be done, two grams can be done. Those are obvious because we have weights for them. Three grams can be done because one and one plus two is three. Four grams can be done and so on. So establish that any number from 1 to 15, any integer weight from 1 to 15 can be done using those four weights. In fact, those four weights were chosen exactly because they allow you to do this. Okay, again, work on this for a minute or two before looking at my answer. So here, here are basically the equations that show you can do that. 3 is 2 plus 1, 5 is 4 plus 1. So basically each desired weight is decomposed into the sum of those fixed weights that we have. 6 is 4 plus 2, 7 is 4 plus 2 plus 1, 9 is 8 plus 1, and so on. So we can do this for all the 15 numbers from 1 to 15. Okay, so what's going on here? Why is this possible? Is there, is there an easier way to see that we can do this? Well, it turns out that Basically, whatever weight you're trying to 
whatever amount you're trying to measure let's say uh, let's say uh, 11 all you have to do is write 11 in binary which is 1 0 1 1 11 is 1 0 1 1 in binary so you have 8 you don't use 4 you use 2 you use 1 that's 11 so these are basically weights of the various binary positions the most significant bit is worth 8 units the next most significant is 2 units the next one 4 units the next one is 2 units and the least significant position is 1 unit so because all the numbers 1 through 15 can be written as 4-bit binary numbers, therefore all those weights can be measured, all those amounts can be measured by using these four weights. So it should be easy now for you to discover that if I add a 16-gram weight, 16 being double eight, so it's the weight of the next binary position, then any amount from 1 to 31 can be measured. If I add in addition a 32 gram weight, then any amount from 1 to 63 can be measured, and so on and so forth. So basically by adding one more weight, which is double the previous weight, we double essentially the range of amounts that can be measured. So with 8 being the last included, we could measure up to 15. With 16 included, we can measure up to 31, more than double this. Then with 32 included, we can go to 63, which is more than double 31, and so on. OK, next puzzle. So here you were given a set of four fixed weights and ask what you can do with them. Now suppose you are in charge of going and buying weights for your lab. And the question is, what is the best set of four fixed weights in the sense of maximizing the range of measurable weights in increments of one gram. So for example, this is not the answer, but let's say I go and buy weights of one gram, four grams, seven grams, and 12 grams. Okay. So the weights do not have to be one, two, four, eight. I can choose one, four, seven, 12. Okay. Now let's see if I can measure one gram. Sure. I have the weight for it. What about two grams? Well, I can't measure it if I proceed according to the previous strategy. But if I'm allowed to put weights on both sides of the scale, and 2 is basically the difference between 7 and 4 plus 1. So if I put the 7 gram weight on one side, and 4 and 1 gram weights on the other, the difference, the amount of material that I have to add to the lighter side in order to establish balance is two grams. Okay, so I can measure two grams if I'm allowed to put weights, these fixed weights on both sides. What about three? Three is four minus one. Four, I already have a weight for it. Five is four plus one. Six is seven minus one. Seven, I have a weight for it. 8 is 7 plus 1. So it seems that I can do a lot. And this, what is the maximum weight that I can measure? The maximum is basically the sum of all these fixed weights. Meaning if I put all the weights on one side, then I have 12 plus 7, which is 19. 19 plus 4 is 23. 23 plus 1 is 24. So by choosing these four weights instead of one, two, four, eight, I extended the range of measurable quantities from one to 15 in the previous case to one to 24. 
Of course, I haven't yet proven that because I sort of skipped some weights. It turns out that you can measure anything from 1 to 24. These four weights that I showed there. Now the question is, is this the best I can do? In other words, can you think of a better set of four weights that can extend the range beyond even 24? Okay, so please think about this. Pause the video. And I will reveal the answer. Here it is. It turns out that the weights 1, 3, 9, 27 are the best possible. Notice that in the early puzzle, the one highlighted in yellow, the weights were powers of 2. Okay? Here you see that the weights are powers of 3. 3 to the 0, 3 to the 1, 3 to the 2, 3 to the 3. Okay, and I leave it up to you to think about this and see why it's a good idea to use powers of 3. And the maximum amount that we can measure here is 27 plus 9, which is 36, plus 3, 39, plus 1, 40. So 40 grams, which is much better than the binary case up there and better than the ad hoc example highlighted in blue. Okay, there are a whole bunch of puzzles having to do with identifying counterfeit coins by using a balance. So here is uh, the simplest such puzzle. We have three coins Two are normal coins. One is a counterfeit coin that weighs less. Identify the counterfeit coin with one weighing and a balance. So basically, you have a balance. You can put, you can choose two of the three coins and put them on the two sides. And then, if the two have equal weight, then the balance remains horizontal. If one of the coins is heavier, then that side will go down. And given that we are told that the counterfeit coin is lighter, then the lighter side contains the counterfeit coin. Okay, so how would you go about solving this puzzle with a minimum, um, with just one weighing, actually? Okay. Think about this. So you can use the balance just once. I'm going to reveal the answer now. So don't advance until you've thought about the problem. Compare coins 1 and 2. Put them on the two sides of the balance. If they weigh the same, point 3 is counterfeit. Because the two that weigh the same are genuine coins. The other one is counterfeit. Otherwise, the lighter of the two is counterfeit. Okay, so this is a direct result of us being told in the statement of the puzzle that there is just one counterfeit coin. Okay? If there's one counterfeit coin and the coins one and two balance, then three must be it. If one and two do not balance, the lighter of the two is the counterfeit. So this was an easy puzzle. Now we sort of uh, increase the complexity a little bit. And see if you can identify a counterfeit coin that is lighter than the other one. So there's just one counterfeit coin and it is lighter than the other one. Okay, there are nine coins. Think about this. And as a hint, uh, the way I've grouped the nine coins is, is sort of, there's a way 
a solution. So think about this and see if you can use two weighings to identify which one of the nine coins is the counterfeit one. Again, I'm going to reveal the answer. So the answer basically is put two groups of three. So call the groups groups A, B, and C. Put groups A and B on the two sides of the balance. If they balance, if they have equal weight, then all six of the coins in those two groups are good. Okay? So put groups A and B on the two sides. If they balance, then all six coins are good, and the counterfeit coin is among the remaining three. We already know from the previous puzzle that we can identify it with one additional way. If the two sides don't balance, A does not balance B, then whichever group is lighter contains the counterfeit coin. Okay? And again, since we know the group of three containing, containing the counterfeit coin, we use the previous puzzle to identify the actual coin with one weighing. So you need two weighings. One weighing uh, about, tries to balance groups of three coins, groups A and B. And the outcome of that weighing either points us to group C as the one containing the counterfeit coin or one of the groups A and B, whichever is lighter. See if you can generalize this. How many weighings with a balance are needed to find a light counterfeit coin among N, N coins? So. The two examples we tried so far is that with three coins, we need one weighing. With nine coin, we need two weighings. Is it reasonable to say that with 27 coins, we need three weighings? Yes, it is. Okay. So the answer to the question is number of weighings is log of n in base 3. And in case that number is not an integer, we take the integer that is greater than that. So log of 9 in base 3 is 2. Log of 27 in base 3 is 3. And log of 25 in base 3, if you have 25 coins, then log of 25 in base 3 is not an integer. The next higher integer is 3, so we still need three weighings we have 25 coins. Now here is a question which is relatively simple for you to answer. How would we change the procedures above if the counterfeit coin is known to be heavier than normal ones instead of lighter? So basically redo puzzles with three coins, with nine coins, with 27 coins. This time, assuming that the counterfeit coin happens to be heavier than the genuine coins, okay? This is for you to think about offline. Okay, now this is the most challenging uh, counterfeit coin puzzle among the ones that we'll discuss today. We have 12 coins containing one counterfeit coin. But we don't know whether the counterfeit coin is lighter or heavier. It can be either one. So 11 of the coins are known, known to be genuine. There's one counterfeit coin which may be lighter or heavier. Okay, how would you go about solving this? Now this will take uh, quite some time if you were to uh, to try it. So I'm going to sort of reveal the answer without giving you a chance to think about it. So we divide the, the 12 coins into three groups of four coins. Why we do this is this is basically, you know, the 
the solver of this puzzle discovered this way of doing it in order to minimize the number of weighings. So we call them group A, group B, group C. Compare groups A and B by using the balance. So there are three possible outcomes. A is equal to B in weight. A is lighter than B. And A is heavier than B. Okay, notice unlike the previous puzzle, if A is, say, lighter than B, we don't know which group contains a counterfeit coin. If A is lighter than B and the counterfeit coin is lighter, then group A contains it. On the other hand, if A is lighter than B and the counterfeit coin is heavier, then group B holds that coin. Okay, so we don't know at this point which one. But if they balance, that, that's the simpler case. If A is equal to B in weight, then C must contain the counterfeit coin. Okay, so this is the simplest case of the puzzle. So this is like the case study that we have been doing for some puzzles before. We take different cases. So now we have to focus on group C and identify So here is uh, how the solution proceeds. Weigh three coins from C against three of the good coins. We already have identified eight good coins in groups A and B. So take three coins from group C. Make sure you don't mix them up with uh, the good coins, okay? Because you want to be able to identify the counterfeit. So take three from group C, say, put them on the right side of the balance so that you remember they come from group C. And take any three coins from groups A and B. If the two groups are equal, if the three suspect coins in group C equal in weight to the three good coins, then they must be good as well. So the remaining, or the fourth coin in group C, is the counterfeit one. And by just weighing it against the good coin, we establish whether it's heavier or lighter. So in this case, we needed three weighings. Group A compared against group B, that's one weighing. Three coins from group C against three good coins, that's the second weighing. And then if they are equal, then the fourth coin in group C against one good coin, and then we know whether that counterfeit coin is heavier or lighter. So this simpler case required three weighings. And then we have to proceed with all the other cases. So for example, backtrack one step. The three coins you take from group C are not equal to the three good coins, okay? So what are the possibilities? Then the, the three coins in group C are lighter. Therefore, they contain the counterfeit coin, and the counterfeit coin is lighter. This reduces to a puzzle that we had before. Three coins, one lighter counterfeit coin. On the other hand, if the three coins are heavier than three good coins, again, this reduces to a previous puzzle. We have three coins with one heavier counterfeit coin among them. You need just one more weighing. So, so far, every case led to three weighings. Okay, now we have to go back and take up the more difficult case where A and B do not balance. And I don't have the complete solution for this. If A is less than B, lighter than B, or A is greater than B, then we have to do similar uh, subdivisions or case studies to establish what needs to be done. Okay, if you are clever, then it turns out that this puzzle can be solved in three weighings, no matter what. Three weighings are sufficient. Okay, here is an interesting way to look at how one might use. This is a different solution, okay? 
the solution says we need three weighings shown in the blue box up here. So that we number the coins so that we recognize them from one another. Maybe use a marker to put the number in each. So take coins 1, 4, 6, and 10, put them on one side. And coins 5, 7, 9, and 12, put them on the other side and weigh them. Then take 2, 5, 4, 11, again 6, 8, 7, 10. And finally 3, 6, 5, 12 against 4, 9, 8, 11. And the claim is the outcomes of these three weighings tell us which coin is counterfeit and whether it's lighter or heavier. First of all, three weighings, each of which can have three outcomes, constitute 27 cases. Okay, each weighing can have the outcome of le left side being heavier, right side being heavier, or the two sides balancing. And we denote these by the letters L, meaning left is heavier, R for right is heavier, and B for balance. And these are in this table on the right side. All the 27 cases have been listed. All three weighings result in the left side being heavier. Uh, the first two result in left side being heavier. The third one leads to balance. Left heavier, left heavier, right side heavier, and so on. So these are all the 27 possibilities of three things, each having three options. Of these 27 possibilities, three of them are impossible, can never happen. So the easiest one to see is balance, balance, balance. This balances this one, this balances this one, this balances this one. So what happened to the counterfeit coin? A counterfeit coin should cause at least one of these weighings to not balance. So that can be ruled out. What about the right side, right side, right side? In all three cases, the right side being heavier. Okay, so right side being heavier. Okay, that can happen if there's a counterfeit coin that is heavier that happens to be among all these three sets, or there's a counterfeit coin that is lighter and happens to be among all these three. And there's no such number, okay? So for example, four occurs in two of these but there's no number that occurs in all three. Similarly, on this side, seven occurs in two of these, but there's no number that occurs in all three. So the right side being heavier in all three weighings is impossible. Similarly, the left side being heavier in all three weighings is impossible. So NP means not possible. So we had 27 cases, three of them are not possible we are left with 24 cases. And those are just enough because we have 12 coins, each of which can be counterfeit, so that's 12 cases. And the counterfeit can be lighter or heavier, that's two cases, so 12 times two is 24. So we have to sort of pinpoint one of these 24 cases. So for example, one of the cases is four, lighter. Another case is four heavier. One more case is one lighter. One more case is one heavier. So that 24 cases altogether. And we have 24 cases remaining in this table. And luckily, or actually not luckily by design, the way we design these weighings, each of those identifies counterfeit coin and whether it's heavier or lighter. So let's look at the, one of the examples. Actually, yeah, the LLB example. So the third weighing balances in this example. So that means these eight coins are not counterfeit. 3, 6, 5, 12, 4, 9, 8, 11 are not counterfeit. So what is left? 
1, 2, 7, 10. 1, 2, 7, 10. are the candidates. Okay, what happens if one is lighter? Look at the other two wings. Uh, one is lighter is not possible because if one is lighter, this weighing would tell me that the right side is heavier, okay? What if one is heavier? If one is heavier, then that's the counterfeit coin. But then why is it that the second weighing does not balance? If one is counterfeit, one only appears in this weighing, and therefore it's impossible for the second weighing to not balance. Okay, so one is ruled out, and similarly, we can rule out all the other ones except seven. So seven is lighter, and that basically is consistent with the, both weighings having the left side heavier, because if seven is lighter, it appears in both of these weighings on the right side, and therefore, that's consistent with the left side being heavier. And question one for this lecture is for you to complete the table to show the counterfeit coin in all of the cases that we did not. So three of the cases we ruled out. Two of the answers are given. So here seven is lighter and here seven is heavier. So your task is to fill out the rest of this table with the identity of the counterfeit coin and whether it's lighter, in which case you put a minus sign in front of it, or heavier, in which case you put a plus sign. Okay, so this leads us to the notion of binary search. But before that, we sort of, let's think about how you would search in an unsorted list. So, for example, the phone directory, nowadays, you know, belonging in a museum because we don't have the printed phone directory. We have online directories. Um, so let's think about the printed hard copy phone directory. It is arranged alphabetically by name of the subscriber, but it's not, it's unordered based on the phone number. So if I give you one of these phone books and say, okay, who has the phone number 765-4321? Nowadays, of course, we have reverse phone directories online and you can enter the phone number and identify the subscriber if they're in fact listed. But imagine now you have this hard copy phone book and I ask you, who has this phone number? Well, because these phone numbers appear in completely random order in the directory, our only option is just scan, is to scan the directory from the beginning to the end, looking at all the phone numbers until we, have, we encounter this phone number. If the phone number is in there, in fact, okay? So if we are lucky, we find it early on, maybe on the first page, are very unlucky, then we may have to go all the way to the last page before we find it. So on average, we have to scan half of the phone book, which is a pretty lengthy process. So searching in an unordered list is time consuming. It takes linear time in the size of the list. If you have n items, it takes order n time, linear time n over 2 on average. On the other hand, if you're looking in a dictionary, again, hard copy dictionaries are things of the past, 
But imagine you have a hard copy dictionary and you're interested in finding the meaning of the word sizzle. How would you go about it? Okay, so let me grab a dictionary and show you the process. So let me focus. So here's my dictionary, Webster's Collegiate Dictionary. And I know that the dictionary is ordered alphabetically. And I know that S is one of the letters near the end of the English alphabet. So I open the dictionary to a page where I think the S words are located. And then look to see where I open the dictionary. So let me put the camera and the dictionary. And uh, I see on top of the page the word scandal. Oh, I got pretty close. I was lucky. I was looking for Sissel, S-C-I, and I found S-C-A. So this means the word I'm looking for appears after this page not before. So I got rid of more than half of the dictionary and this one opening. Now, I guess that since I've opened to the SCA page, SCI isn't too far away. So in the rest of the dictionary, I open maybe around here. And then again, look at the word on top of the page. So I see, for example, the word simple. This means I overshot the word I was looking for. This is SI and I'm looking for SC. Therefore, the word I'm looking for is in this section between the first examination and this examination. Notice how small the section is with just two openings, two they're known as probes, two probes of the dictionary. I'm pretty close now. Okay, so again, open somewhere in this range, and then look at the word at the top. I see serve. Serve is still past the word I'm looking for, so I will focus on this part, and so on and so forth. Now, if I had no idea about the distribution of letters and whether, you know, suppose I'm doing this in a foreign language, and I don't know how frequently used each letter is, then my best bet would be to open the dictionary at its midpoint on first try. That will tell me whether the word I'm looking for is in the first half or in the second half then the middle of that part that is not ruled out on the second try. So this is also a binary search. Each probe, I divide the range of possibilities to have. If I started with a 1,000 page dictionary, after the first probe, the word will be limited to 500 pages after the second probe to 250 pages, then to 125 pages. So each probe divides in half the range of possibilities. And therefore the total number of probes until I get to a single page will be log of 1000 in base two, which is approximately 10 which means in the worst case, I need to do 10 probes to find a word in a 1,000 page dictionary, which is pretty good. I imagine if the dictionary were unordered and I had to scan the entire book from beginning to end, that would take a very long time. So binary search is a mechanism that is used for searching in an ordered whether the order is in numerical values, in alphabetic order, or whatever. 
Okay, I'm going to skip this slide in the interest of getting to being able to cover everything else. Okay, there's a guessing game online. Uh, Khan Academy has it. And I provided a link to it here. So I'm asking you to, so basically, and you have to guess a number. And then you provide your guess. So let's say the number is in the range of 1 to 300. Okay. They, you guess, say 100. And the computer answers too high, too low, or exactly correct. Yeah, of course, you must be lucky to get it on the first guess. But if the computer says too high, so 100 is too high, then you focus on numbers 1 through 99. If it says too low, you focus on numbers 101 to 300. And then you continue in this way until you identify the number. Okay? So question two that you have to deal with is to play the guessing game above, link given above. For a number in 1 to 300, three times, when you go to that page, there is a simple guessing game at the beginning. That's not the one I mean. But near the end of the page, where the guessing game for numbers in 1 to 300 is listed. And then it's pretty easy to play. You just click on a number to choose it. And then the, the user interface basically eliminates all the numbers. So if you guess 100, and 100 is too high, then all the numbers from 101 to 300 will be crossed out. So it's pretty easy to play. So I want you to play this game three times and record the, and report the number of questions you ask in the three rounds. So you might say eight questions in the first round, maybe 12 questions in the second round. So three numbers you report. And then attach a screenshot of the final winning screen in one of the rounds. I don't want you to do it for all three rounds. So play three rounds, report the outcome, number of questions you ask, but attach the screenshot for just one of the rounds. Okay, so let's dig, dig a little bit deeper, deeper in the binary search algorithm. So here's a list of numbers. And uh, we are faced with the question, is the number 85 in this 63 entry list to the right? So the, the color shading is used to sort of separate uh, 10 entries. So 10 yellow entries, 10 uh, mustard entries, that's 20, 10 blue, that's 30, 10 light greens, that's 40, uh, 10 purple, that's 50, uh, and 10 violet, that's 60, and 3 at the end. So there are 63 entries in this list. And then I ask who is the number 85 in this list? And the binary search algorithm basically says, go to the middle of the list. Where is the middle of the list? Well, the first entry is 1. The last entry is number 63. So the middle is the average of those two. 1 plus 63 divided by 2. So go to the 32nd entry of the list and see what number you find there. And this first probe gives you the number 71. And the outcome is that the number you're seeking is greater than that. Therefore, you have to focus um, in the part of the list after 71. Okay. So that means you have to focus 
on entries 33 after the middle to 63, which is the last one. So in this case, the last parameter remains the same. The first one, which was 1 initially, now becomes 33. Average of these two is 48. So you examine the 48 entry of the list, and you see 102 there, and the relationship is less than. So the number you're seeking is between this first probe and the second probe. So 33 through 47, the average of those two numbers is 40. So go to entry 40 of the list. You'll find 87, that's too large. So the number you're seeking is between the first and the third probes, and so on and so forth. So in each step, basically, you either keep last fixed and change first, or you keep first fixed and change last, and then you continue until you encounter the equal condition. In this case, one, two, three, four, five, six probes led you to the number 85. So the six probe is basically here, in the middle of these two. Now, the logarithm of 63 in base 2 happens to be about 6. 64 in base 2 is 6, so this is almost 6. And you needed 6 probes. So in general, you need n probes for any list of 2 to the n minus 1 entries. Or conversely, you need log n probes in a list of n entries. OK, now in this example, I knew nothing about the distribution of the numbers. I have no idea where 85 is. It can, in fact, be at the very beginning, it can be at the very end. OK, however, when I know something about the distribution of numbers in the list, so I see the numbers go from 1 to 133, I can use something called interpolation search, meaning that I notice that 85 is closer to this n number than to the first number. So instead of going to the middle of the list, to go to this element of the list, which is size of the list, 63, the number I'm seeking minus the minimum number the maximum number, so this is basically the span of the list, max minus min. This is how far my number is from min. I multiply this ratio by size to sort of estimate where in the list the number might be, assuming that the numbers are more or less uniformly distributed. So the first probe will be at location 63, size of the list x minus min, 85 minus 1, max minus min, 40. So this interpolation search suggests that I have to go to location 40, and sure enough, I am almost there. And then looking at position 40, I see that that number is too large. Therefore, I have to go in the first part of the list. Where in the first part? Well, because the number I'm seeking is very close to 87, the interpolation tells me that 40 is how many elements are in the list? 85 minus 1, the difference between what I'm seeking and the minimum, divided by the difference between this last element in the new list and the first element. And it's uh, the answer is about 39. And sure enough, when I probe that, so I just needed two probes using interpolation search. This is sort of what I do with the dictionary. Okay, when if you give me a word that starts with U, 
I don't open the dictionary up in the middle because I know U is at the very near the end of the dictionary. So I'd say, okay, let's open the dictionary to, you know, a page that is 90% truth rather than midpoint. Okay, so this basically makes the search more efficient. Fewer probes are needed. Now, lists are generally dynamic. In this case, you know, this list is given to me. If it never changes, then I can use it over and over to search for different numbers. So imagine these are perm numbers for students at UCSB. And imagine that perm numbers never change. You always have the same group of students with the same perm numbers. This is unreasonable. But then every time I want somebody with a given perm number, I just do binary search in this list and identify that person. And typically in front of the perm number, there will be a name that I can read out. But now imagine that this list is dynamic, meaning it changes. We add students to it. We remove students from this list as they graduate, say. Then this ordering of the list is not a very efficient thing to do because the list changes. Every time I want to add something, let's say to this list, let's say I'm going to add 72. Then I have to shift all the numbers after 71 to make room for 72. So even though it takes a logarithmic number of steps to search this list, addition requires linear time. On average, I have to move half of the list in order to make room for a new entry. Similarly, if I delete one entry, let's say I delete 70, then I have to shift everything up to fill that gap so that my binary search algorithm works. So when you take insertion and deletion into account, then a sorted list may not be the best option because there's a lot of overhead in maintaining the sorted order as you add and delete things from the list. So here are some examples of dynamic lists. Students currently enrolled at UCSB. Customers of a wireless phone company currently having active connections. That changes because somebody's phone call ends, so connection becomes inactive. Somebody starts a conversation, a call, so a new connection is established. Even static lists may change on occasion. So for example, the list of UCSB graduates class of 2000, you might think that's a static list because you know anybody who was going to graduate has already graduated and that list should not change. However, there are often cases of uh, people who are missing from that list have to be added later. People for whom we have to make corrections in name or perm number or other information. So it's not as dynamic as the previous two lists, but it does change a little bit. Okay, so how do we deal with dynamic um, lists so that Searching is efficient, insertion is efficient, and deletion is efficient. All three. Remember, in, sor in sorted list, search was efficient, but insertion and deletion were not efficient. In an unsorted list, on the other hand, insertion is efficient because you just add the new thing at the end of the list because it's unsorted, okay? So you don't need to move anything else around. Just add at the end of the list. And if you want to delete, delete one entry and then take the element at the end of the list and put it there. So with a couple of operations, you update the list so that it now has one fewer element. So an unsorted list has efficient insertion and deletion, but inefficient searching. Okay. So now we are looking for something that is efficient in all three 
operations, insertion, deletion, and searching. This structure is known as binary search tree, where each node contains a number. So the list of numbers in which we are searching, shown here, appears in the nodes of this tree. And the arrangement of the tree is such that if the number 71 is at the root, every number on the left side, on the left subtree, is smaller than 71. And every number to the right, in the right subtree, is greater than 71. OK? Now, how we make the tree this way, we'll discuss later. But for now, let's look for the search algorithm. Suppose you want to find 47. You examine 71. So, OK, 47 is less than 71. So we have to go to the left. Compare 47 with 35. It's greater. So we have to go to the right. Compare it with 57. It's less. We go to the left. Compare it with 45. It's greater. Go to the right. Compare it with 49. It's less. You go to the left. And there you found it. The number of levels in such a binary tree is logarithmic, and therefore searching requires a logarithmic number of steps, just as it did in an alphabetically ordered list. Okay, let's take another example. Find 112. Go to the right because 112 is larger than 71. Go to the right again. 112 is larger than 102. Go to the left because 120 is larger. And then in this case, you don't find it. When you run out of places to go and the number has not been found, you deduce that the number 112 is not in this list. Now, let's look at insertion. Insert 48. OK, 48 is less than 71, so it has to be inserted in the left subtree. It's greater than 35. It's less than 57. So basically, 48 is greater than 47, so it has to be added on the right of 47. And suppose I want to delete 116. I look for 116 first. And then when I find it, I basically delete it. Now in this case, I was lucky 116 was at the end, was at the leaf node. If I wanted to delete 117, for example, I can't just delete it because that would sort of um, this allow access to these two numbers. I have to sort of rearrange the numbers in this part. But that can be solved. I don't want to get in too much detail here. OK, so you see that insertion and deletion also take logarithmic time. So this is an efficient structure for searching, insertion, and deletion all in logarithmic time. However, you see here that when I added 48 and when I deleted 116, the tree lost its balance. Originally, it was completely balanced, meaning that the path from the root of every leaf had the same length. But when I inserted 48, the path grew by 1 in that one case. And when I deleted 116, the path shrunk by 1 in that one case. So over time, as I insert and delete, the tree can become extremely unbalanced and therefore lose that logarithmic property, OK? So here is an example of a highly unbalanced binary tree. 
And this may happen to your tree after many, many insertions and deletions. And then now you have some very long paths in this binary tree. You also have some very short paths, but in the worst case, latency will grow as the tree become more and more unbalanced. So you need to come up with a way of rebalancing the tree every once in a while when it gets out of balance in order to ensure that that logarithmic uh, time for insert, delete, and search remain valid. Now, artists have taken binary trees and played with them. Uh, these are binary trees, as you see, start from the bottom. This is a branch. It is divided into two branches. Each of those is divided into two branches, except that the length of the branches are different and the angles are different, perhaps randomly chosen to create these pieces of art. OK, I'm going to skip this one too, this slide. So in practice, we don't use binary trees, but we use multi-way search trees that this example shows. So let me show you one more example of binary search that doesn't have to do with finding something in a list. This binary search algorithm allows us to find uh, uh, one of the roots of the equation x4 plus 5x minus 2 is equal to 0. So f of x is x4 plus 5x minus 2. Now we evaluate f of 0, replace x with 0, you get minus 2. f of 1, replace x with 1, you get 4. So f of 0 is negative, minus 2. And f of 1 is positive, plus 4. Therefore, this function has a root in the interval from 0 to 1. Because f of 0 is negative, f of 1 is positive. So the function crosses from negative to positive somewhere between 0 and 1. And I may be interested in finding the exact value of the root. OK? So there are various ways of solving equations, such as this one. If you want to use binary search, here is how you proceed. So you basically evaluate the function at the midpoint between 0 and 1. f of 1 half is 0.5625, or 9 16th. So now the root must be in this interval from this negative value to this positive value. I've eliminated now this right interval from consideration. Take the midpoint of that interval, midpoint between 1 fourth and 1 half, that's 3 eighths. Evaluate the function. Function value is negative. Therefore, the root is now in this interval from 3 eighths to 1 half. OK, and you can continue in this way. So the next uh, probe will be at 7 16th, halfway between 3 eighths and 1 half. And you find the value of the function. And you continue until that interval becomes pretty small and you have the root with high precision. Now, as question three, I'm asking you to continue the root finding process above until the error in the root. The error is basically the difference between the two ends of this interval. Until the error is less than 0 0.001, 1 in a 1,000. OK? So that's your question three. Continue that process. And finally, a fun activity that, again, is related to uh, binary search is creating binary tree mazes. So you start with a grid like this, which is the outside of the maze, the entry point, and the exit point. 
entry point is let's say at the top left and the exit point at the bottom right then subdivide the area into two parts with an opening between them. So this is how you would design a binary maze. So I subdivide the area. The two areas do not have to be equal. The top area in this case is smaller than the bottom area. So I divide by drawing that horizontal line, but I must make sure that there's an opening in that line because otherwise the two sides will become disconnected and the maze will not have a solution. Okay. Repeat this process for each of the two areas. So for example, the top area, I do this division into two parts. Again, there's an opening between the two. This is the opening between the two. This is one part. This is another part. And this is the opening. And then do the same thing at the bottom. Again, remember the two parts do not have to be equal. Divide this area, again leave an opening, divide that area, divide that area, and then you continue this process until no further subdivision is possible. That will happen when basically the areas have one dimension equal to one, so you can no longer divide this area here. But this area can still be divided, okay, this area. And as question four, the final question, I'm asking you to complete the design of this maze, proceeding until no further subdivision is possible. Okay, so take this initial state that I'm giving you here, continue dividing. So for example, draw a line here with an opening, of course, let's say in the middle, and so on. Until and proceed until no further subdivision is possible, and then submit the diagram of your maze as answer to question four. Okay, so this is uh, all I wanted to say about binary search. Uh, remember, when you submit uh, answers to the four questions. Uh, make sure that uh, the subject line of your email refers to lecture six, ECE 1B, and that at the top of the body of your email, you provide your name and PERM number. PERM number is important because my list is arranged by PERM numbers so that I can update the list on the course web page, which is also arranged by reverse PERM number. So please do provide your PERM number in every submission. Um, so this lecture uh, is scheduled for uh, Monday, 4th of May, and answers to the four questions are due by Wednesday, 6th of May, 6.30 p.m. Please submit on time. Okay, Wednesday, 6th of May, 6.30 p.m. Uh, thank you and see you in the next lecture.